Bom, boa tarde novamente para todo mundo. É com grande prazer que a gente traz aqui o Rui. É, basicamente, para quem já é usuário de R há muito tempo, dispensa apresentações, né? mas eu vou falar um pouco sobre ele. É, o Igor é engenheiro de software na, na Estúdio, né, hoje em dia. Ele tem seu PhD no Departamento de Estatística da Universidade Estadual de I.O. O principal interesse dele é em gráficos estatísticos interativos e computação estatística. E como um ativo usuário de R, né, ele é autor de vários pacotes que todo mundo conhece, provavelmente todo mundo usa dia a dia, é, como Niter, Bookdown, Blockdown, Sharingan, Animation, DT, TinyTech, né, e muitos outros pacotes. Entre eles, o pacote Animation ganhou o M. Chambers Statistical Software Award em 2009, e ele também ganhou outros prêmios né, na, na Universidade de I.O. E ele também é coautor de diversos outros pacotes do R, entre eles o Shine, né, que muita gente apresentou coisas aqui. É, além disso, ele já publicou uma série de livros né, sobre esses pacotes, ele vai falar um pouco sobre isso na apresentação. E, pessoalmente, como um antigo usuário do Swift, né, eu e todo o pessoal que está aqui, é, a gente vê o, o Niter, né, que ele criou como uma grande revolução na maneira da gente criar documentos dinâmicos no R. Então, se hoje a gente consegue editar livro, criar página web, aplicação Shine em pouquíssimo tempo, é, isso deve amplamente ao trabalho do Rui. Então, você acha que seria, seria difícil a gente pensar em pesquisa reproduzível com R hoje em dia sem essas ferramentas que ele criou, então, por isso é uma grande honra receber o Rui aqui hoje. Eu vou falar uma introdução também em inglês e daí já deixo a palavra com ele. So, Ihui, uh, it's a software engineer in our studio. He earned his PhD from the Department of Statistics at Iowa State University. Uh, as an active R user, he has authored several R packages, as uh, all of we know, such as Niter, Bookdown, Blockdown, Sharingan, Animation, and many others. Uh, The animation package won the John M. Chambers Statistical Software Award, and he also uh, won the Vince Esposito Computing Award and the Snedecor Award in the Department of Statistics at I.O. He also co-authored a few other R packages, including Shiny, R Markdown, Articles, and Leaflet. He also published a number of books that he will, he will show in his presentation, And uh, he's involved also in organizing our conference in, in China since 2008. So personally, as former Swift users, uh, we believe that Niter was a great revolution in the way we create dynamic documents uh, in R. So if today we are able to edit books, web pages, and create Shiny applications in a few minutes, this is due largely to Yihui's work. So it would be difficult to think of reproducible research in R nowadays without all of these tools. So it's a great honor to welcome Nihui today in our day. So thank you, Nihui, once again, and the audience is all yours. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction, Fernando. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of our markdown. Um, yeah, I just want to share some experience, uh, but I'm not sure if uh, this experience would be useful to you or not. Anyway, um, so first, uh, as uh, Fernando just in introduced, I'm currently a software engineer at our studio. I studied in st statistics from 2002 to 2013. So for the first seven years, I studied in China, at the University of China. And then after 2009, I came to the US and uh, did my PhD at Iowa State University. You can know a lot more about me from my personal website, yihui.org. So I have two um, hobbies. <laughs> first one is programming. I, I love programming. And I program mostly in R and occasionally in JavaScript. I don't consider myself an expert. 
And I also love writing. And actually, I love writing even more than programming. And also, I'm not a, an expert. But with these two interests uh, combined, I mean, combining when you combine programming and writing, that, that actually leads to an interesting outcome, which is literate, literate programming, or you call that LP for short in this talk. So literate programming is the key idea behind our markdown. So today I will introduce uh, something about the history of our markdown from literate programming. So before that, I want to uh, briefly show you where I am right now. So I, so I, I, I created an, an R package named Meter in uh, 2011, and I wrote a book, Dynamic Documents with R and Meter. And later, I uh, uh, co-authored the R Markdown package with a few colleagues at R Studio. So. Um, the R Markdown package was born, and then I wrote the, I co authored the book R Markdown, the definitive guide with uh, two other colleagues. And after the R Markdown package, I started the Bookdown package and then the Blogdown package, and I wrote three other books. So that's where I am right now. So, first, I want to uh, talk about how this long journey started. So it started from uh, a tool named Sweave. Sweave is actually like a, a function in base R. You can know more about Sweave uh, from the Wikipedia page. So Sweave actually, uh, as its name indicates, it, it has it has something to do with the S language. Sweave basically means S plus Weave. So Weave is a concept in uh, literate programming, which I will uh, introduce uh, later. So basically, Sweave allows you to uh, mix LaTeX code with your R code or S code. So the, the program code, R or S, can live together with your documentation, like the LaTeX code. And then you can compile the whole document. So the R code or the S code will, will be run executed and the, the results will be uh, in the output document. So that way you can write, you can create a report uh, without running the code separately or copying and pasting the results into your report. You can just write that single document, compile that single document, and you get a report. So I started using Sweave in 2007 and I fell in love with it. I did all, all basically I did all of my homework assignments in Sweave whenever possible. And I also tried my best to promote Sweave to my uh, classmates. I really loved it. So I want to show you some of my uh, homework assignments when I was doing my PhD at, at Iowa State. So for example, this is a screenshot of uh, a course, uh, Stats 503 which I believe is the multivariate statistics. HW4 stands for homework number four. So that's so basically in this homework assignment, this is basically a PDF generated from Sweave. So you can see there's a plot, there's code, there's the text output from the code. And I can show you <clears throat> more of these examples. Uh, I have a lot of them, like STAT 503, Homework 4, Multivariate Statistics. That's what I showed you just now. And see, there are some other, like STAT 546. Uh, That's, uh, I believe, a non parametric statistics. And then you can clearly see this is a homework assignment. There are were a few problems, and you can see the code and the output. So all these PDFs were generated from Sweep. Um, there are more, like step five. Oh, oh. Oh, this is the non-parametric statistics. You see code, plots, text output. 
one more. Um, I don't remember. Oh, this is uh, STAT 601. I don't remember the name of that course, but again, this is a PDF generated from SRIF. So I did a lot of homework assignments in SRIF. You see, this one was from 2010, it was 11 years ago. So, yeah, as I said, I, I used SRIF extensively in, in, when I was doing uh, my PhD. So why, I, why did I use SRIF? So later I heard people tell me that, oh, you should use SRIF for, for the sake of reproducible research. But at that time, I, I didn't know much about reproducible research. For a student like me doing my homework assignments, reproducible research was not the most convincing reason, although later it turned out to be an important reason. But at that time, I was not aware of uh, this reason. I, the, the most important reason I used SWIFT was for convenience. So before SWIFT, I, when, I, when, I, when I was doing my homework assignments, I had to run the code separately, and copy the results, and paste them into uh, my final document. So that way is, it was not convenient because if I had to change code for some reason, for example, if I change a parameter or I change a function, then I would have to repeat this process. I, basically, I have to change the code, run the code again, copy the results again, paste them into my homework assignments again. And that, that was a very boring process, so I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I wanted to do all these things automatically without manually uh, copy and paste. So in case you are not familiar with SWIF, so an SWIF document looks like this. So it, it is, um, the overall structure is like a LaTeX document. So, you know, if you have used LaTeX before, every LaTeX document starts with uh, the document class. It could be an article or a book or a report or slides. Then you begin your LaTeX document. Inside the LaTeX document, you have you will have code chunks for SWIFT. So a code chunk starts with uh, the syntax like this. So less than, less than, greater than, greater than, equal. So that denotes the uh, header or the beginning of a code chunk. So after that line, you can write R code in the chunk and eventually uh, you can use at to uh, finish this code chunk. So after the at sign, you can start writing your narratives or text or prose or documentation. So that is what uh, 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 an SWIF document looks like. So an SWIF document often has the file name extension RNW. So R stands for the R language, NW stands for no web. So I will introduce no web uh, in a minute. So a file typically looks like um, test.rnw. That is an rnw document. Um, so as you can see, you can mix your R code with your documentation uh, language or documentation code. So SWIFT is actually much more powerful and flexible than its ancestor. And its ancestors include web and no web. And as I said, I will introduce them in a minute. And SWIFT is powerful because if you can use chunk options to control the behavior of your code chunks. For example, inside the uh, angle brackets, less than, less than, uh, between less than, less than, and greater than, greater than, you can write chunk options like echo equals false, which means I don't want to output the source code in the report. And width equals eight, that means that I want the size mm -hmm. of the plot to be eight. Uh, inches. So you can use a lot of chunk options to control or tweak the output. It was very flexible. So where did that 
that syntax come from, the less than, less than, greater than, greater than, equal, and at. That actually came from uh, the uh, idea by Donald Knuth. And he came up with this idea of literate programming in 1984. And 1984 was actually the year I was born. So it's kind of interesting that I'm talking about an idea from the year I was born. So literate programming basically <coughs> uh, means that you can uh, mix your computer program with uh, the natural language of humans. Like you can mix the code to be executed with the code for humans to read. So there are two types of languages, the computer language and the human language. So we, you, if you have those two components in the same document, you can compile the whole document. So there are two concepts in literate programming. Uh, one, is ten, one is called Tango, the other is called Weave. So Weave is, you know, as Weave, the Weave in S Weave came from this uh, component, Weave. Tango basically means that you can extract the computer program. I mean, you can extract the code chunks from that document. So you can extract all the code so that you can uh, run the code later. And weave means you can mix uh, you can mix the code chunk with the documentation, and you can typeset the whole document as a report. So you can just like compiling a LaTeX document, you can get a PDF uh, report. So you can weave the code chunks with the narratives. So for the implementation, so Donald Knuth uh, implemented later literate programming initially as a tool named web. So this web has nothing to do with uh, uh, has nothing to do with the world wide web. So th this web is more like the, the spider web. You know, you, you can uh, you can make a web by mixing a lot of things together. And then later there was another implementation named C web. So as I mentioned earlier, so a literate programming document consists of computer programs and yeah, natural language. So for a computer pro program, you can use different languages. For a web, uh, Knuth originally used uh, Pascal as the computer language and LaTeX or, or maybe Tech as the natural language. So for C web, the computer language was um, I became C. And then the natural language, I think it was still written in tech or later. So these are the very early uh, implementations of literate programming. And that was in 1987. And then two years later, another tool was invented. It was called NoWeb. So NoWeb extended the idea so that um, there, there was basically no restriction on the type of the computer language. You can use any language that you like. You can use C, you can use Pascal, you can use other languages like Perl. So basically it removed the restriction on the computer language. So that is no web. And all these uh, tools, web, C web, and no web, they all use the syntax uh, great, uh, smaller than, smaller than, greater than, greater than, equal, and at. We all use with this syntax. So that is where this syntax uh, in SWIFT came from. So talking about literate programming, uh, I always believed that there was a lesser known fact about literate programming, and I, I think it, it is also very powerful. And that feature is uh, that you can you can label all of your code chunks and reorganize them freely in a document. What does that mean? That means so for each chunk header, you can assign uh, a label. Like here, I'm using chunk A as label of the first code chunk, and then I'm using the label chunk B as the label of the second code chunk. But Notice that in the first code chunk, in chunk A, I have the 
syntax like this, smaller than, smaller than, greater than, greater than, there's no uh, equal after greater than. So this is the syntax to embed other code chunks in this code chunk. So for example, if I'm using the syntax here, I, I, I mean, I'm embedding the content of chunk B into a chunk A. So basically that means, so I'm writing a function add one and the, the body of this function would be x plus one. So I'm embedding chunk B inside chunk A. And this mechanism is actually very powerful because it allows you to write uh, a, a complex piece of program code in, in smaller pieces. So for example, if you have a complicated function that is very long, you, you don't have to write all code in that code chunk. Instead, you can write smaller pieces in other code chunks and then embed these smaller pieces into the main code chunk. This is a very powerful uh, feature that uh, I don't think many <coughs> tools uh, have implemented this idea, but, but it was implemented in, in NITA. So I have one example um, uh, at this address, uv.org slash RLP, R for literate program. And I also have many other examples in one of my blog posts. So if you have access to my slides, you can you can, you can read um, these two links uh, later. So this literate programming is very powerful. So then I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the birth of uh, NITA. So SWIFT's implementation of literate programming was actually quite clever, novel, and simple. But I think its full source code was around 700 lines and the, so as we was born, I think before 2002, but it does have some limitations, um, which I ran into frequently when I was doing my homework assignments. For example, there was no easy way to spe specify the size of a plot in, in the output. So that thing bothered me a lot. So, and also as we um, focused on LaTeX output. So the, the documentation language was pretty much LaTeX. It, it, the, the, there, was, uh, there were some extension packages later to support other languages like HTML, but it was still limited. And the most important thing was that it was not very easy to extend. But uh, extension packages based on as we actually existed. For example, cache as we've, which implemented a fe the feature of caching. So if you have some time consuming code chunks, you can cache those code chunks. And PGF as we've, which uh, features high quality uh, TIKZ graphics. So I really loved the TIKZ graphics uh, compared to uh, the graphics, uh, graphic devices in base R like PNG or PDF. TIKZ is really beautiful. And there was uh, also a highlight package which implemented the syntax highlighting for us with, and there was a R2 HTML, which implemented um, the HTML output for us with. But the problem is that you could only have one extension at one time. For example, you cannot have both caching and TXZ graphics. So you have, you have to make the choice of one of those packages and not all of them. So if you use one feature, you have to lose other features. That was kind of uh, painful to me. So in uh, late 2011, I was uh, curious if I could just write one package to combine all these nice features and at the same time, I want that package to remain extensible. So that was how the Nitter package was born. So again, uh, the, the idea of uh, literate programming consists of the programming code for a computer and narratives for a human. So the programming code can be in any language, like R, Python, Julia, JavaScript, C++, or SQL. 
The narratives can also be written in any documentation language, LaTeX, HTML, Markdown. And so when I was designing Knitter, I really wanted to support all the computer languages and all the documentation languages. Or if I if I couldn't support any of these language at languages, at least I wanted uh, Knitter to be extensible. So if anyone else is interested in any of these languages, he or she should be able to uh, implement that um, by himself or herself. So Knitter was initially uh, developed in uh, 2011. On um, October 16th of 2011, then about four, three, four months, uh, three months later, uh, I made the initial crane release in 2012. And today I have made uh, 50 crane releases in total during the past 10 years. The latest release the version 1.34 was actually from today. I just made that release this morning. Um, so after I wrote this Knitter package, I started writing my very first book titled Dynamic Documents with R and Knitter. So that was a few months before I graduated from Iowa State University. So why did I write that? book. So the reason was that I, I, had to, I had to document this package anyway. So the, the, the question is, which form should I use? So the full documentation of this package was actually a little lengthy. So I was thinking, oh, why not just write a book? Uh, although I had never written a book before, but you know, I was a PhD student at that time. I had uh, I had a lot of free time, and more more important more importantly, I was fearless. <laughs> Although I had I had never written a book, I was fearless. So why not try it? So later it turned out that the content I had I had a lot of uh, uh, things to write in terms of the content. For example, the package documentation. And there were also a lot of questions and answers from the Nether mailing list and also on Stack Overflow. So I could use these questions and answers in, in the book. And I could also document the uh, package internals in, in, the, in the book. So it turned out that I had, a, I had enough content to write. So then I just wrote that book. And so the first edition of the book was published in 2013. And it, it focused on RNW documents, which means it, it, it had a focus on uh, LaTeX output. Then two years later, as R Markdown became much more popular than uh, LaTeX, I updated this book and published the second edition in 2015. So I want to share a few uh, lessons that I learned uh, from writing the Knitter package in the book. So the first one is that if, if you want to uh, write any useful software, I would recommend that you tackle a problem that you run into very frequently by yourself. For example, for me, I just wanted I just wanted to do my own homework assignments more efficiently. I didn't want to copy and paste. So that was my pain point in graduate school. So I just I, I just tackled that problem. And later, you know, I was lucky enough that my effort turned out to be also useful to other people. So once you, you can solve your own problem, I think you will, you will feel very excited in that. I think that can be uh, where the flywheel effect uh, starts. I'm not sure if everyone knows about the flywheel effect. That, that is something that I truly uh, believe in. So basically that means if you, have, if, uh, if you want to achieve something substantial, something giant, that is like pushing a, a flywheel. 
you have to push, you have to keep uh, pushing turn upon turn. You have to build momentum until a point of breakthrough. And then once you have a point of breakthrough, then I think you, you will have, yeah, your journey will be uh, much, much uh, smoother. So the Nitro package was my uh, starting point of breakthrough. And I was very excited about it. And that, that started my uh, career as a software engineer. So second lesson is that if you, if you want to make uh, a huge impact, I would recommend depth uh, before uh, seeking breadth. So I actually have, uh, I have written a blog post titled uh, Impact, Depth, or Breadth. So basically the idea is that um, if you want to solve a problem, I would recommend that you solve it uh, deeply. For example, after I wrote the Nitra package, that was actually not enough. I, I considered that not enough. I, so I, I just wrote a book. You know, a book is kind of more substantial than things like a blog post or tweets. So if you think you have uh, created anything substantial, I would recommend that you consider writing a book. And that will, I think that will, you, you will have a much uh, deeper impact by providing uh, things like, uh, like a book. And the third lesson is that uh, you can uh, make use of the community help. For example, for Nitter, it has uh, received uh, 441 pull requests on GitHub over the past 10 years. And it has uh, nearly 100 contrib contributors in all these years. So a lot of people helped me a lot. So I benefited a lot from the community help. Um, the fourth lesson is that uh, anytime you look at the existing software packages, you may feel, oh, this, this package might be the best choice. But I, I, want to, I just want to let you know that the current best choice could be improved or even challenged. So if you think Nitter is good enough, you, you can consider like, writing another package to replace Nitter. That is fun. I mean, software is written by humans and no human is perfect. That is how, how I, uh, what I thought when I, I created the Nitter package. Although I, I really loved S-Wave at that time. Um, but before you uh, invent another tool, I, I also have another lesson to share. So basically in, in retrospect, 10 years later, I mean today, I feel I was not nice enough to as the as with authors uh, in the beginning, and I think I appeared ungrateful, and I, I'm very sorry about that today. So when you write a new tool to replace an old tool, you have to recognize the second mover advantage, because your pioneer has solved a lot of problems um, before, before you are even aware of them. So you should, yeah, we should uh, show our respect and be grateful to the pioneers in the field. So basically, yeah, today I'm, I'm very sorry for what I did in like 10 years ago to as we, I think I was, I was too aggressive and was not grateful enough. Um, then I want to move on to our markdown. Um, um, so, the, uh, for our markdown, there was uh, it actually it actually has two generations. The first generation of our markdown was based on uh, the R package called Markdown. So that was uh, Markdown was written in two thousand and twelve, I think, and then we came up with the first generation of our markdown in two thousand and thirteen. So uh, 
please note that this markdown package is not our markdown package. So th these are two totally different packages. The, the mark markdown package only supports uh, HTML output. And, but although it only supports one output format, it quickly became popular. So you can go to the website rpubs.com to, to see maybe there, there, there are a million of uh, reports published to rpubs.com. So that uh, this rpubs.com was uh, created when the first generation of Amazon was, uh, was born. So then about two years later, we uh, created the second generation of Amazon and it was based on a tool named Pandoc. The, the, the reason for using Pandoc was that we wanted to support uh, multiple output formats uh, besides uh, HTML. For example, we want to generate Word outputs, PDF outputs, PowerPoint, or eBooks, or um, other types of slides. So Pandoc is very powerful. It can convert Markdown to many, many other output uh, formats. So I had an I had an initial experiment in 2014. So that is a function in Pandoc in the meta package. So basically, you can pass an, an R Markdown document to this Pandoc function and, and convert that R Markdown document to, all, um, to, to, to the output formats that Pandoc supports. But that was an, just an initial experiment. I, I don't really recommend you to use this function today because later, later uh, this, uh, this work matured as the Armacan package in 2015. So that is the second generation of Armacan. So basically this generation of Armacan is based on Pandoc as I just mentioned. So basically when you uh, pass an RMB document to the render function in the Armacan package, Basically, it will first call uh, the meter package to knit that, that R markdown document to, to a markdown document. And then this markdown document will be converted to other output formats by Panda. For example, it could be compiled to PDF uh, through LaTeX, or it could be compiled to HTML report or a Word document. That is how the R markdown, the second generation of R markdown works. So uh, R Markdown, although the name is R Markdown, it is not only for R. So as I mentioned earlier in the idea of literate programming, you, you should be able to use any computer languages. So R Markdown supports multiple computer languages like Python, Julia, JavaScript, uh, SQL, and so on and so forth. You can learn more about them from the Markdown cookbook. So in 2018, I uh, co-authored this Markdown Definitive Guide with two colleagues. You can you can read this book for free online. And then two years later, actually last year, I wrote this book, Markdown Cookbook, with other uh, two other co-authors. Then you can read this book for free. So the Definitive Guide is more like a reference book which you can know a lot about the technical details about markdown and the mark the R markdown cookbook uh, in, uh, consists of many recipes basically the form is like you have a problem and i will tell you how to solve this problem so all these recipes are relatively short so it's more like a problem solving book and then in uh, 2016, I started creating the Bookdown package. So this is an R package based on R Markdown for writing books and long reports. <coughs> so it supports basically most of the uh, output formats that Pandoc supports. 
so since this is a package for writing books, so it, it included some uh, features, um, especially in academic writing, like, like for uh, cross references. You can cross reference your tables or figures, or you can write uh, elements like theorems or proofs, or like, yeah, a lot of math environments. Then one year later, I started writing the blog down package, which is for uh, creating websites with R Markdown. The blog down is based on uh, both R Markdown and uh, static site generators. And the most popular one might be Hugo, but blog down also supports uh, Jekyll and Hexo. So basically, the year. 2017 could be summarized as another year, another package, another book. So I wrote, uh, I also wrote the lockdown book, which you can read for free online again. So there are a lot more packages in the Armacon ecosystem now. So for example, the articles package uh, makes it possible for you to write journal papers from uh, from R Markdown, the Tafti package offers um, the, the Tafti format in both HTML and PDF. Page down package uh, allows you to uh, create applications in the HTML format, but uh, all these applications could be printed. So when you, when you read an HTML page or a web page, it's, it's uh, almost always like a, a a single long page. The page down can can split that that long page uh, into multiple pages, but the format is still HTML. So you can you can write a book in HTML, but page down can help you split that book into multiple pages in HTML. Flash dash flag, flex dashboard um, makes makes it possible to create dashboards and. Uh, Jaringan allows you to create uh, slides, like my slides here were created from Sharingan, obviously. And there are other packages for slides like Shower or Packages Istio that um, makes it possible to write uh, journal papers in the HTML format. And there are many more. I'm not going to repeat, uh, I'm not going to introduce them one by one, but yeah, I just want to tell you that the Armatan ecosystem consists of many, many extension packages now. So, yeah. Um, so, after introducing the history of Armatan all the way through web, no web, C web, S weave, meter, and then Markdown. Um, you might ask, what about the future of our markdown? So we have, but, uh, we, I mean, uh, the our markdown developers, we have learned a lot in the past decade from all the all those packages in the ecosystem, and currently we are launching a new, exciting, and much bigger project related to our markdown. But that, that project is still very young, so I'm not going to advertise that here. I just want you to stay tuned. Hopefully, you will uh, hear something about that maybe early next year. Um, that's all I have for you today. Thank you very much. Now I'm ready to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Yuhui. I I was thinking to to ask you uh, what was the future mm -hmm. of all this this down, block down book down packages, and now your your last slide was you say there is something even new yeah. that is coming. So it is just amazing to know that we can go further. So we have a few questions uh, here. Let me, let me put one is from Valmis, who is here, but he's very shy to ask himself. 
So he asked how Markdown and R Markdown uh, literate programming tools are related to Emacs org mode. My curiosity is about a, a historical perspective because neither is unbeatable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have heard about the work mode many, many times, and actually, it, it is one of the things on my to do list. I, I really want to learn more about it, but I still haven't found time. I, I, I heard people who are like, <laughs> they are very passionate about the work mode. They told me it is very, very powerful. But yeah, you know, before I before I started using R Studio, my previous editor was actually Emacs. I, I was using <laughs> the ESS in Emacs. And before Emacs, I was actually using Pin R. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jose was here with, with us today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I can I guess I, I can't really answer this question other than saying I, I feel work mode is work mode is very powerful, but I'm, I'm yet to learn. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, I already tried to use our mode, but it is very powerful, but uh, a little bit complicated also. Yeah, I have to, to dive into it. Yeah, I've heard people like ma manage their to do list with more mode. And they were like typing so fast and inserting the date, and mark an item as done. <laughs> Like, it was like a magic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, there is another question from Anderson. Uh, so Anderson asks, in respect to web programming languages, what we can expect about future of R with such connections to JavaScript, Angular, and other languages to data visualization? Um, personally, I'm strongly interested in JavaScript, so I, I believe yeah, at some point, I think, although our graphics is very powerful, but I mean, in, in the long future, maybe like in 20 years or 30 years, I, my personal feeling is that JavaScript utilization will win. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. we, we started the, uh, we created the, the HTML widgets package. So, you know, that is like one bridge between JavaScript visualization and R. That was, uh, I think it was a useful package, but yeah, still, I feel we still have some work to do there. I mean, yeah, I, I just, yeah, I truly believe in JavaScript visualization. Yeah, fancy, powerful, and beautiful. Yeah, that, that's great news also. Um, Julio Trescenti, he says thanks a lot for your talk. I really love Sharingan and page down packages. Do you think that page down will eventually replace PDF LaTeX reports? Um, I don't really know, but yeah, overall, I feel <laughs> if, if, if page down is going to replace PDF or LaTeX, if it will happen, I think it will take several years, maybe like 20 years. <laughs> Personally, <laughs> I, I, I believe in HTML. I, I think, although currently typesetting in, in HTML is not as powerful as LaTeX, but I, I think in other aspects, LaTeX cannot beat HTML. For example, interactive visualizations, you can, you can do them in HTML, but you can do them in LaTeX. <laughs> So if you typeset a, a report in HTML using page down, your readers can, can still interact with your report. Like they can play with the interactive components like interactive graphics in your report. But for other people who prefer reading the printed report, they can still use page down to print that HTML report. So I think, yeah, I think the web technology will, be, will become more and more powerful. The, the disadvantage of HTML will eventually, I think, it will, it will disappear. So, yeah, I think the HTML technology will catch up someday. Yeah, okay. So, the, also, Julio Trescente asks, what's your favorite Naruto character? 
Uchiha Itachi. <laughs> uh, yeah. Responded and Samuel Macedo, who will give the last tutorial uh, from Tidy Models, asks, I don't know how to pronounce it. Sasuke or Naruto? Sasuke Naruto was the best. I don't know. Um, yeah, I guess it's just hard to tell. <laughs> it's hard to answer. I mean, <laughs> in the 700 episodes, Sasuke. Most of the time, Sasuke just appeared too too dark to me. <laughs> like, Naruto has more like the sunny side. <laughs> I, I like. I, I tell. I like Sasuke's um, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I don't know. It's a shame for me, but I don't know okay. either. <laughs> um, Jose Claudio Faria actually is here. He says he was very happy to know that you use it, Tinar, in the early days. Yeah, I used Tinar for many years, like from 2016 to maybe 20, oh, sorry, 2006 to 2010, I believe. So at least four years I used Tinar. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Yeah, he talked. He he he's still maintaining the our project and appreciating the interface. Mm -hmm. So it's very it's a very nice project. Uh, a curious statement: Jose Lopez says most of the money to feed my kids has come from the capability of writing good visual statistical analysis with tools like our Markdown, Shiny, and Eater. I'm very grateful for your work, Yui. <laughs> Thank you. I think many people uh, should should tell the same. I'm, I'm really honored to hear that. Thank you. Um, let me see. Uh, Fernando, can I add something? Fernando? Yes, please. Well, first of all, thank you for your historic perspective. I think we we have in this meeting, as you saw, uh, choose a title about history and about community. Mm -hmm. And I think the three talks we had today were really along these lines. Mm -hmm. And you gave us a piece of history. And when you mentioned about the development of NITER, you, you also pointed the, the, the importance of having a community work. You, you mentioned the contributions you had from, uh, at your GitHub project from 99 contributors. Mm -hmm. And uh, curiously, earlier today, uh, on a question asked to Jose Claudio, they asked him what the first thing to to consider when writing a package, and his answer was make it available to to the community. So <laughs> we have some common ideas here. But if, if I can go back uh, to the history, we everything started when you you were born, as a, as we understand in 1984, right? <laughs> so, but not talking seriously. Well, with the ideas of literary programming, and then later in the R community when Fritz Fleisch brought s to to run uh, with R, and then several tools started to emerge, like R2 HTML, you mentioned also HMISC has a HTML function and so on. And then we came with, you came with Niter as an aggregating tool, which put a lot of things together. You made a beautiful case of the chunk reuse, which is a powerful thing, and also the importance of caching for heavy computations. So really nice features. I, I'm curious, when you were, when you look at back at, at this initial period of, of your development, mm -hmm. which were the, the big challenges when you started to put things together in, in it? And currently, which are the bottlenecks you you can see uh, at this moment? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in the beginning, I, I introduced myself that I told you I, I majored in statistics for 11, uh, uh, yeah, 12 years. <laughs> so I was never trained. I was never formally trained as a, a computer scientist. I, 
I, I, I learned most of the programming skills by myself. So, um, yeah, that's probably my bottleneck. Although I don't feel that bottleneck is uh, is too restrictive. I mean, although I, I I don't know a lot about programming, like like algorithms or things like that. I yeah. I feel my yeah my skills might be enough, but I don't know if if I, if I learn more about uh, like if, if I learn more formally about you know, programming, I might uh, I might contrib contribute uh, I might be able to uh, contribute more. Yeah. So yeah, in terms of challenges, um, I I didn't feel. A lot of challenges in the very beginning. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, when I was a PhD student. I, I had plenty of free time, and I was brave. But at this point, you know, um, I became like busier and busier. So, I guess my my bottleneck is time right now. <laughs> I really sometimes I really don't think I, I will have time. I will have enough time to do the job. Maintaining too many packages on my on my shoulders. So maybe this new project will aggregate. I'm trying to I'm trying to discover. Exactly, we are trying to aggregate all the previous packages into a huge project. Yeah, so we we have a hint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Uh, Gabriel is asking here in Portuguese. I'll try to translate. He asks, uh, "What you what you tell to people from Python to leave Jupyter Notebook and start using R Markdown?" Uh, well, I don't know if I could give a fair answer as the yeah. author of R Markdown. <laughs> so yeah, I feel. Well, it depends on what you want. I mean, there are some features in R Markdown that I don't think would be possible in Jupyter, like the like the, that lesser known fact about literal literary programming and labeled code chunks and reuse them. I don't think that's possible in, in Jupyter. Um, yeah. I mean, but yeah, mm -hmm. the problem for R Markdown is that when other uh, when when people from other communities, I mean the computer language communities like Python or Julia, they when they see R Markdown, they often think oh R Markdown is only for R. But that yeah. that is not true. <laughs> it's hard to explain that oh you can use Python in R Markdown. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but when you show to these people from Python that you are able to run not only Python but many other languages in one document, mm -hmm. then then we uh, uh, we conquer them. We always show this in, in classes here mm -hmm. from people from different backgrounds, and they 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 come with this. They only think that R Markdown is for R, but we show that we can use Python shell in many other languages, and yeah. they all fell in love for for R Markdown and for R. That's great. So I don't think if Paulo yeah. or anyone here. I uh, saw one comment in the by I don't know how to pronounce Jerusalem who, who, who wanted me to mention a uh, great great flash. Oh yes, okay. Yeah, can, can I share uh, my screen again? Oh sorry. Yeah, yeah this is something I here I should have done. <laughs> yeah. So Jerusalem, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is my screen still shared? Yeah, free to read, free to less. Yeah, I, no, I, I can I can put your screen here. Okay. Yeah, I can briefly talk about this. Yeah. So yeah, I I'm, I'm sorry. I really should have <coughs> talked more about the <laughs> the main author of S Wave, free to read, less. So he <coughs> yeah, S Wave was mainly uh, written by him and included in in, in his talk. So. S wave is a function <clears throat> in base R, and yeah, he he really deserves a lot of uh, credit uh, from 
uh, from me. The, yeah, so Niver was greatly inspired by S. I, I, I can't, I just can't thank you enough. Yes, as you, you you also mentioned it in one of your slides, the to be grateful to pioneers. Right. Yeah. That we in in a greater extent what we are trying to do in these are days mm -hmm. to do just that. We we invited Heather Turner who talked about the history mm -hmm. of the R community. She showed us uh, so many important people for for the R. Uh, for their development. Mm -hmm. And then we had Jose Claudio Faria, who was also an important uh, contributor to the AR project. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you when you downloaded AR, you didn't have any uh, interface. You had that little interface in Windows, but TINAR makes, uh, I think Chin, we think that TINAR made many people to start using AR because it facilitated mm -hmm. and now we we also are uh, we invited you to talk about these these many many tools you developed so I think it all it all goes in the same line in here and so I think we don't have any more questions uh let me see oh we have one more question here yeah i've heard about uh, filter in julia but i have never used it so yeah I, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you know any interesting features that are missing in amartam please feel free to let me know I don't know Pluto, something like I marked down for Julia. Yeah, that's that's similar to uh, Meter in R. Ah, okay. Yeah. Basically also an implementation of Pluto designing. Okay, so Yuhu, it was uh, a great honor to receive uh, to receive you here. Mm -hmm. We will make a brief uh, closing session here, and if you don't mind to stay with, with us. Mm -hmm. for a few minutes. Uh, I, I was speaking Portuguese, but I promise it will be short. So okay. if... Bem, pessoal, então só queria agradecer a todo mundo. A gente vai fazer, uh, fazer esse encerramento aqui informal do do Ardei, aproveitar a presença aqui do, do Rui. Então, eu queria agradecer muito todo mundo que participou. É, eu tentei acompanhar o máximo possível todas as palestras que foram gravadas e que foram disponibilizadas. É, a gente ficou muito satisfeito com a interação, né? A gente não sabia se ia dar certo, mas a gente ficou muito satisfeito porque todos os vídeos, mesmo os gravados, sempre tinha pessoal assistindo e interagindo, e eu acho que esse formato ficou realmente bem interessante, e a gente vai, na medida do possível, deixar todos esses vídeos gravados, tá, na, no canal do LEG, e os materiais a gente vai pedir também para o pessoal que quiser disponibilizar o material na página, é, a gente vai pedir e vai colocar na página do, do Ardei também. É, então, é, Acho que é isso, eu queria, a gente vai tentar manter o Ardei, né? A gente pretende fazer um evento anual aqui. E da minha parte, acho que é isso. Vocês querem falar alguma coisa? Bem, eu, eu gostaria de falar uma breve palavra. First of all, thank you again, Ihai, for, for nice, nice talk. Thanks for being with us. Uh, the Brazilian community is a growing community and it's becoming very active. And I hope this this meeting will make a difference for many of the people who are here with us today. I'm sure it will. Uh, I just want to say a big word of thanks for my colleagues, Fernando Maia, Wagner Bonacci and Valmi Zeviani for the organization of this event. 
we are open to suggestions, we are open to ideas and for contributions. We will certainly run our day again, probably next year, as Fernando was saying. Uh, and I believe that the history and community fits beautifully together. So it was a great idea. Congratulations on the condition of that. And also I'd like to say that Fernando has tested uh, many ideas on how to broadcast this, this small conference. Uh, tools, resources has used. So it was a combination of resources, mixing different computational tools. And of course, you'll be, will be open for your feedback. So if you have any ideas or anything to say, please contact us, share your ideas, share your views. And I hope we can learn from that. Então, gente, muito obrigado a todos e, como chefe do Departamento de Estatística da Universidade Federal do Paraná, eu só digo que é um prazer poder trabalhar com esses colegas e ver o que eles são capazes de trazer para a comunidade do R aqui no Brasil, pelo grande estímulo que tem né, dessa comunidade tão legal que a gente tem aqui no país. Então, um, um bom desfecho de, de evento aí para aqueles que vão acompanhar a apresentação do, do Samuel né, e nos veremos em breve em outras oportunidades. Legal. É isso aí. Eu gostaria de valorizar mais uma vez a, a importância desse evento. Para a gente é muito grande, principalmente pela contribuição de todos que nos assistem, principalmente das pessoas que submetem atividades. Né? Desse evento, nós, nós convidamos apenas os conferencistas e o restante da programação foram, foram todas programações sugeridas, submetidas pela nossa comunidade. E acho que é isso, isso que enriquece, que faz o, o evento tão interessante. E eu gostaria de parabenizar também a todos que se inscreveram nos minicursos. Nós tivemos uma, uma taxa de, de, de presença muito grande, né, da ordem de 75%, 80% dos minicursos da manhã, algo bastante grande para a gente que está acostumado com o ensino remoto. É, então, agradecer a participação de vocês e aguardo vocês no último minicurso, que é o do Samuel, para fechar o nosso evento. Obrigado. É, ainda bem que você lembrou, um grande agradecimento para o pessoal que está fazendo os tutoriais, para a Beatriz, para o Samuel, para o Wagner, Ricardo e Henrique, né, que se disponibilizaram a dar esse, esses tutoriais para vocês, e também ao pessoal que enviou as apresentações orais, que foram bastante interessantes também. Como eu falei, deu certo, né, de pessoal visualizar, interagir. Então, eu agradeço vocês que fizeram o Air Day, né, a gente só organizou. So, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you very Fernando, much. Mais again. uma coisa. Oi? Mais uma coisa. Oi. Comunica aí, semana que vem tem semana acadêmica do curso de estatística com programações também dentro da. É, da que é tanta tal. coisa. Comenta, comenta aí, comenta aí. A gente tem aqui no curso de estatística, a gente está organizando no PEC Estatística, semana acadêmica de estatística, que começa na segunda-feira. Deixa eu pegar o link aqui. Começa na segunda-feira. E vai até sexta, só que não é o dia inteiro, né? é na parte da noite. É, é um evento mais acadêmico, né, voltado para o pessoal da graduação, mas tem vários minicursos que, que estão, é, estão sendo organizados e tem palestras muito interessantes também. Também é tudo gratuito, vocês podem se inscrever ainda. Então, também é uma, uma boa chance de participar e aprender mais algumas coisas, né, é, durante a semana que vem aí. Então, obrigado por ter lembrado que eu já... A programação está riquíssima da semana acadêmica, no horário noturno, creio que muitos de vocês vão poder participar, porque não dá conflito com, com o trabalho aí, então tem tutoriais de pacotes, tem discussões, tem pessoas falando da profissão, projeções futuras, é um evento, sem dúvida, que vai falar muito de estatística, ciência de dados, big data, então fica aí o convite a todos vocês que participaram do Ardei a participar da semana acadêmica. Legal, obrigado por ter lembrado. So once again, thank you everyone, thank you Yehui, it's a great honor. And we see you next year, everyone. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.